So in this video, I want to demystify the function graphs and the value processor nodes, which are gonna make the whole process a little bit easier. But why would you wanna use function graphs? Functions give us further control over our projects and help us streamline graph behavior. However, traditionally, the values that are output by our functions have not been easy to see outside of the function graphs themselves. And so with the value processor node, which I have here in my graph, we can see that we're gonna very easily be able to see the output information of our function graph behind the scenes. So with this value processor selected, we can go ahead and click on its only parameter, which is going to bring us into our function graph. And so we can see here that I've gone ahead and created essentially what is going to equal out to be a calculator. So right now our final output is gonna be zero because we're not actually outputting any of this information from our function. So say I want this addition between these two float numbers to be our output. I can go ahead and right click this node here and set that as our output. And that's gonna highlight it orange. And we can see that now we're going to get the final sum or the result of that node. And again, if I come back into our graph here, we can see that I'm going to very easily be able to see that final result. And it will be the same thing for our multiplication. Again, multiplying that by two. And we can also go ahead and set the output as this node here, which is going to then divide six by three. Now, while calculators are certainly cool, we'll notice that the previous graph that we had taken a look at is not really flexible on the user end. And we'll have to go back into that graph to actually manipulate some of the values. Instead, what we can do is take a look at injecting our own custom parameters into these function graphs to make them a little bit more robust. So I'm gonna double click on our graph here to come into our graph properties. And I wanna come under input parameters and let's go and add a custom input. So we'll notice that it's going to be of float one. And this is where I wanna take the opportunity to kind of talk about data types. And we'll see this little drop down right over here. Every value in a program has a data type. Integer values are full numbers. Floating point values are numbers with a decimal point. Integers and floats can be positive or negative. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave this as a type of float one with a slider editor. However, I do wanna go and change the identifier just so that we know this is something that we've custom made. So now that this custom property has been made, Let's go back into our value processor, into our function graph. And the first node that I want to take a look at is going to be get float. And now we'll see that we have a ton of different options, but remember that we're using a float one or just float. So let's go ahead and get float. And we can see that it's gonna give us a bit of an error because it's not drawing any information from anywhere. But if I come up into its properties, we can see that we're gonna get the identifier my underscore input. So I'm gonna create another float node. And let's go ahead and just add these together. So now when I go ahead and right click, set this as output, I'm also going to change this from zero because obviously adding to zero is just going to be our input. Let's go ahead and set this to 0 0.5. So now we can see that when I go ahead, come back into our master graph here and play around with the default of our parameter, we can see that I'm actually changing it, right? So if I go ahead and set our default to be 0 0.5, we're actually gonna get one because we're also adding a value of 0 0.5. So it's important to remember that information that we are providing within this function graph is going to be local to the graph itself. However, information that we're going to be creating in our graph properties here is actually going to be global. And so we can just use this information to broadcast globally across this project. And we're going to be able to receive this information and use it in various graphs. And so that's how I'm able to go ahead and actually receive this input value in this function graph here. Now that we can go ahead and access user input, let's go ahead and use this function graph in a node scenario. So I'm gonna keep our value processor here and I'm going to add a Gaussian noise node. 
And so I want to use the output value from our value processor and go ahead and directly connect that to the disorder of this node here. And so you'll notice that we aren't really going to be able to access this node, right? Because we don't have a socket on the left side. But what you might not have noticed is that if we go ahead and click on this, we can actually create input values. So I'll create a little input value down here. And you can see that that's going to add a socket onto the left side of this Gaussian noise. So I can go ahead and just plug this in. And now nothing's going to happen immediately, but we're going to have to do a couple things first. So again, in this Gaussian noise, I want to come and just change the name. Now it's not super important what you change the name to, but I generally try and make it descriptive as to what this value is affecting. So in this case, it's going to be the disorder. And remember that we're also going to be using a float type for this data. So we're going to keep it on float one, but you can see that we can use a whole range of different data types. So now while this value is set up, we actually have to connect it to the parameter that we want to alter, which is going to be our disorder. So I'll come up to the disorder and we'll have this little drop down here. And if I click on that, you'll see that we can use this hash disorder value that we're going to get from the input that we've plugged in. So now when I go ahead and select that, you can see that if I go ahead and double click back into my master graph here, right, using our input parameter, we can actually play around with the disorder, which is going to go through our value processor and ultimately end up altering real tangible data in our pixel nodes, which is going to be really, really cool. Let's look at a more practical example as to why you'd probably want to use this in your graphs. So we can see here, I've got a brick one and a Gaussian noise just plugged into this warp node. And so if I go and change the scale on this Gaussian noise, we'll notice that the intensity is going to remain the same. And it's actually going to be a little bit too intense, the smaller that we actually make this noise. And so it would be nice if we could go ahead and somehow link the scale to the intensity of this warp node so that as we scale it up, we actually kind of decrease the intensity to preserve really the foundation of the node that we're plugging in. And so how we'll go about doing that is by using two different value processors and one custom parameter for this graph. So let's go and create the custom parameter first. Again, just clicking this little plus. And I'm going to call this my distortion. And just as a refresher, we're making sure that identifier is what we'll be looking for in our function graphs and label is what we're going to be calling this on the user side. So I'm going to create this as a float one because I just want to use a slider like this, which we're going to go from a value of zero to one here. And that's going to be pretty handy on the user side of things, but it's not necessarily going to be the best from the functionality side. And what I mean by that is that if we take a look at the Gaussian noise, you can see that a value of zero, well, is not really even possible with this node, right? If I go ahead and hit zero, it's just going to be black. And a value of one is going to be this kind of mid gray color. So for the sake of functionality and usability, we're going to have to find a way to kind of remap these values to a range of zero to one. And for the sake of this demonstration, I found that a value of four being our minimum and a value of 32 being our maximum to be probably a good range that we can use. So let's quickly create this in our value processor here. So now in our graph, we've got our minimum value, we've got our maximum value, and let's go ahead and quickly just snag that custom value that we've created, my distortion, and we're gonna be using that as kind of the range that the user is gonna have access to. So how do we actually use these values to redefine a range? Well, we can go ahead and start to type in lerp or linear interpolation, but chances are you'll probably call it lerp. A linear interpolation node remaps a control value to a custom range. In this example, zero will return the A input or minimum value, and one will return the B input or maximum value. Values in between will interpolate between A and B. So I can plug our minimum value into A here. I can plug our maximum value into B and X is going to be essentially the range that we're going to be remapping this out to. 
that's pretty good so far, but we actually have one more quick little fix we need to do. And that's going to be casting this data type to an integer. So if we recall, right, we'll note that these are float values, but if I go ahead and take a look at our Gaussian noise, notice that we're actually working with integers. So that's a little bit of a, an extra hiccup or obstacle that we have to be aware of. But now if I go ahead and set this as output, you'll see that we're going to get just an integer value. And that's actually going to change the output socket for this node, whereas before we've seen it's green because that's been a float value. So let's go and quickly create an input value here. And I'm going to call this hash scale, making sure that it's also of integer one so that these colors are going to match here. And let's use this to go ahead and just control our scale. So now, if I go ahead and preview our distortion here, we can see that a value of one is going to be 32, and a value of zero is actually going to be a value of four. Now we're gonna be using that same functionality for our intensity, albeit it's gonna be just slightly different, because now, when we go up to a value of 32 or our distortion slider is at one, we actually want the intensity to decrease in order to kind of match that scale. And inversely, if we go ahead and decrease this, we want to increase the intensity because our noise is gonna be a little bit larger. So if I come into our value processor here, for these floats, we're actually just going to kind of invert them. Where if our distortion slider is at zero, we actually want the intensity to be a value of one. And when it's at one, we want the intensity to be around 0 0.1. And I'll go ahead and set this as output, again, because we're gonna be using a float value. So we're not gonna to need to cast this to an integer. And finally, let's go ahead and just quickly connect this to our intensity input here. So that now if I go ahead and play around with our distortion, at a value of one, we can see that it's actually remapping it to 32 for the scale, and it's remapping it to 0.1 for the intensity. And as I go ahead and bring this down, it's going to decrease our scale, but actually increase our intensity. So this has been a quick look into defining functions in graphs, using custom input values, and finally looking at real world situations where we can use function specific nodes, such as the linear interpolation node.